questions in the Q&A section. Dr. Paris, you can start your lecture now. Okay, Roberta, thank you for this uh, introduction. I'm quite nervous in this presentation. It seems that it's the, the first one of my life, <laughs> but I think that this, just because it's my first uh, webinar, maybe. <laughs> so uh, I hope that it, it will in a good way. Okay, I divide my presentation in, sorry. That's the thing that I was <laughs> afraid of. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not good. Let me see. I'm trying to skip this slide, but it's not working. Let me see why. Oh, okay, now it's, so I divide my presentation in three parts. Uh, the first one will be about the domestication syndrome uh, concept. But before we go to plants, I will introduce this concept using uh, animals because I think that you are more uh, familiar with the dog, for example, than, than a plant. And when you see this, to this difference between what occurs during domestication of the dog, uh, the, the, the most important thing, of course, you already know this, is that there is a huge uh, a modification in the behavior. So we have this docile animal here, and here we have this ferocious animal that is the, the, the wolf. But uh, what is quite important here, you, you may uh, read notice that there's this very interesting inversion in the morphology of these two animals. So the, the tail of the dog uh, tends to go upward here, as you can see in this Labrador. And uh, in some breeds, the, the, the breads, this, this come to be a, this, uh, sometimes it's, it's a curly uh, a tail. And, in, and this the opposite in the, this white animal, the, the wolf, and you have the opposite uh, in the case of the ears that uh, come uh, upwards in the case of the wolf and, and so on. But what is quite interesting is that when you see other animals that were domesticated, you see quite the same trait. And, and this is the definition of domestication syndrome. It's a set of traits that you can see and uh, that you'll be able to see in a, in a domestic animal and you can't see in a white animal. But although this is a very simple uh, concept, there are some, uh, something that behind this, it, it, in the case of animals, for example, uh, it, it, this suggests that there is, there's a kind of pleiotropy behind the uh, domestication syndrome. And uh, what is very interesting, why I said uh, pleiotropy, I said this because what our ancestor, they, what they, uh, selected was not this, of course, this kind of morphology. What they select was the, the as I said, the, the behavior. So selecting for docile the, uh, animals or animals that can be tamed, uh, all of this trait came together. And uh, this is more, uh, more interesting when you, when you, some of you uh, may be aware about this famous experiment where uh, a scientist in Siberia it is start to select, he start to select uh, some foxes for, for the, same, uh, the, the same behavior that is uh, uh, a fox that can be tamed. And the, the final phenotype uh, proved to be quite similar to the one of the, the dog. So if you are from USA, now you, you can have a, a fox as a pet, not only a dog. But uh, what I want to do here is to, to use the novel domestication uh, to, to do things, uh, uh, the, the, to do the same in plants, but uh, something more useful than a pet. Although I, I'm not, it's okay. <laughs> I, I I like pets, but uh, uh, this is not the point here. And uh, when you see uh, the same concept uh, in plants, uh, I I have to mention that domestication syndrome was uh, was proposed by Charles Darwin, and it was proposed for mammals, and we just extended this concept for, for plants. And in the case of plants, it's, it's quite, it's even more uh, interesting, because, uh, for, for example, the non-shattering, the, the no dispersion of seed, uh, that is a major uh, domestication syndrome trait, uh, in this case, is, uh, although in the case of animal, you can say, well, all of them are mammals, so the, that's why the, the traits are the same. But here we, we are comparing a grass with a legume, 
and you have the same kind of, of trait because this, this trait is fundamental for a domestication. If you, if you uh, don't have seed dispersion, you will be able to harvest the seeds. And if you are able to harvest the seeds, these will be the seeds that, that will go to the next generation. So it's a kind of automatic selection, although some authors call this uh, unconscious selection. And uh, another very important thing behind this is that uh, in the case of the, uh, I don't know if people already know exactly the, the genetic basis of the, the, the domestication syndrome in, in, in animals, but in the case of, uh, of plants, some of the, the, the trait, uh, the genes behind the trait was a red cloned. In the case of the, the rice here, this non sheltering character is related to a NAC transcription factor. And in the case of, uh, of soybean, is a bell-like protein. And uh, th this, I, I want to, to, to reinforce the, 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 the idea behind this, that uh, a so complex trait, uh, trait that was selected in the past, it uh, can be solved into a monogenic, a Mendelian character. But in the case of uh, another very important uh, domestication uh, syndrome, is the giganticism. This is quite obvious. And this is, it's quite uh, uh, famous in tomato, where most of the domestication of tomato involved this increase of the size of the fruit uh, from the Solano Pimpinelli farm, that is, is the pea size fruit here, to this beef steak, a giant tomato. There are some of these tomatoes that has uh, more than one kilogram. So if you want to, to buy one kilogram of tomato, you, you, you should ask the seller to cut <laughs> it for you. <laughs> This is, and uh, in this case, of, of course, it may be related to a continuous variation or a polygeny. But even though you can, we have this concept that uh, a giganticism of, of the size of a fruit of a plant, it's something polygenic. You, in the case of tomato, at least, you can solve this in in a small region of of chromosome here. This is a KTL map, quite famous in tomato. And uh, what is more important here is that most of these genes uh, behind this KTL prove to be monogenic or this, this lossy. And uh, we now know the, 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 the genetic basis of this gene. So in the case of the, the beef steak tomato, the, the large with, with uh, a lot of uh, locals, uh, you have this fasciated gene that is a clavata. So it, it clavata and, and vusha, that is another gene behind domestication in tomato, it's quite known in Arabidopsis. It's for those that are from the plant physiology science, that is my, my, my area, we, we know that uh, this system controls the size of the mirror stem and the size of the mirror stem is important for the size of the fruit. And, uh, <clears throat> and this brings us to the second part of my talk that is, the concept of the novel domestication, and this depends on, on this idea that is that most of the, the mo domestication, at least for tomato, is based on monogenic traits. And uh, I also want to elaborate a little bit in, in the limitation for the novel domestication. So uh, as you, uh, I already uh, said, uh, it's very interesting that uh, uh, at least for most of the variation that occurs during tomato domestication or from Solano Pimpinelli folium, that is the ancestor of tomato, to the cultivate tomato, uh, most of the traits are, are monogenic, as I, I put here, not only those related to, to fruit size like fasciated and, and the fruit weight, uh, KTL, uh, that now we know the, the, the gene, but uh, uh, other traits that uh, they grow habit. And, uh, and also other traits relate to plant development. And uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, this is sometimes controversial. And uh, I, I have seen something in the, the presentation that, that came before. Uh, most of the, 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 the stress resistance is, is related to, is believed to be polygenic. Uh, I said this is controversial. And, and later on in this presentation, I will try to to make a case stood uh, uh, on this on this on this topic, 
But the idea of domain, the novel domestication, it's an inversion. It's a, a, a kind of think of, of, of the box because breeders are trying to, we're trying to, to, to do this, that is to pass this, uh, this res the, the genes behind the, 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 the stress resistance from uh, white species like Solano galapagense, Abrocite to tomato. And uh, now we, that we have this information, the, the, the genetic base of domestication in tomato, we decide to recreate the same mutations that occur uh, during tomato uh, domestication. We, we decide to recreate them uh, in those uh, stress resistant species. And doing so, uh, the idea is to create a tomato that is edible <laughs> because most of them are not edible. Uh, and, uh, and also that uh, preserves the stress resistance, even though it is polygenic, because actually we will not uh, deal with the, the stress resistance. It, it, it should be, should continue there. And uh, as Agustin, that is one of, of the author of this paper, uh, have showed you yesterday, uh, we, we have made the proof of concept of this using the same ancestor of tomato, the Solano Pimpinelli folium, uh, that also have some, some uh, characteristics that the tom tomato has lost during his domestication, this kind of uh, uh, genetic er erosion. And we, we have done the proof of concept using this species. I will not go further in this slide, although I will uh, uh, return to it later on in this presentation. And uh, what I, I, I want to, uh, to, to present to you now is what I, uh, uh, as I, I put in this, in this second, uh, second part, is the limitation of the novel domestication. And the main, the, the main limitation behind the novel domestication is the complexity of the genes, although they are Mendelian factor, uh, the kind of uh, modification or genetic modification that created the, the domesticated alleles, uh, most of them are quite complex and I will try to, uh, to show you this. Uh, in the case of fasciated, for example, it is the only one here that is a loss of function. Uh, the other ones, uh, most of them are, are gain of function. What is, and this is not good <laughs> if you want to manipulate it. I will try to show this. Uh, for example, this, this uh, fruit weight chew chew is a major gene of tomato domesticated. This is quite famous. It accounts for 30% uh, of the size of the fruit. And uh, as you can see here, the, the domesticated allele, here we have the two alleles, the white type and the domesticated one. So this is the, the expression of, of the two alleles during uh, the, this, the, the development of the fruit that is uh, the development of the fruits after the antesis. And uh, as you, you can see here, although the domesticated allele, I, I don't know how the name, what is the it's a pur uh, purple, <laughs> the, the, the name of this color, but uh, it, uh, uh, although the, the domesticated allele, the purple one, uh, has a lower expression during the fruit development, actually in the beginning of the, the development of the fruit, its expression is it's increased when compared to the, the white type allele. So it's, it's a quite uh, a complex uh, uh, modification. Uh, we don't know the nature of this, although the gene was cloned, but the, the authors, the, the Tanskill group, when they published this, this paper many years ago, they, they didn't solve this. And uh, in the case of another very important uh, uh, fruit weight gene, the, the fruit weight uh, three, two, we have a structural uh, variation. Uh, in, in, in this case here, we have a duplication. So this is a gain of function allele, the domesticated allele, as I said before. And uh, this was, it's a very recent paper. And what this, the, the group of Zach Lippmann is showing here is that probably the gain of function uh, was caused by this duplication. It's kind of a, a little dosage that uh, create more expression on this. Uh, now we have uh, 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 editing uh, uh, tools that uh, that can create this gain of function a little, but uh, it's quite difficult to create this 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 structural variation. And in the, in, the, in the case of the fasciate, 
uh, there is another case of structural variation. And this case is not a duplication, but at an inversion. So the, the breakpoint that create this duplication in the facet, the one that, that create the, the beef steak uh, fruit, uh, it starts in the, in the first uh, interim of the, the YAB gene, that is another gene important for the control of the Mersen, this is quite a famous in Arabidopsis too. And, uh, and uh, some kilobases uh, uh, upstream to the, the start code of the, the clavata tree. It probably, probably causes a, a, a loss of function of the clavata. So as you can see here from the same paper from Zach Lipman group, uh, what we have here is a, is a, it's a no expression of the clavata tree and, and the enlargement of the myrosin. So although it's a structural variation that is difficult to be recreated by gen editing, uh, we were able to create, since it's a, it is a loss of function, this was one, one of the genes that was our target for this de novo domestication uh, experiment. So we, uh, I think that you'll be not, not able to see this. This is quite small, but we put the guide RNA for not only, this is a multiplex a vector created by Dan Voitas uh, group. Uh, we, we, have, we were one of the first to use it. And uh, uh, one of the genes that we, it, it, that worked quite well was this. Although we, we are not able to create the, the same allele that occurs during the mesh case, but we, we create this, this conventional, using this conventional uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 uh, uh, tool, we are able to, cr to create some indels that, that, uh, that cause a loss of function and the, in the, as in the, the, the original allele, it, it enlarged the size of the mirror stem. But, uh, the enlargement of the, the meristem and the fruit was not that great. So we tried to compensate this, uh, uh, augmenting the, the number of fruits. So we, we tried to compensate for the small fruit that is, we, the, the idea is not to create when we talk about the novel domestication, uh, in the case of tomato, to create a, from a Pimpinelli folium pea size fruit uh, to create a beef steak tomato, but a cherry tomato will be good. We, we are happy with a cherry tomato will be okay. But uh, I will go, uh, 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 what I, I want to, to, to show you now is that the, to my point of view, the, the most important limitation for the novel domestication, although this is just a, a proof of concept, but uh, uh, this will, uh, in order to perform the novel domestication, uh, we have to invest in basic science, and this is actually good because uh, most of the genes behind uh, domestication are not cloned yet. And uh, in the case of tomato, that is the, the, the theme of this, this talk, uh, it is quite interesting because <clears throat> people are quite obsessive about tomato fruit, but uh, it's quite obvious that one of the, the most important uh, traits behind tomato domestication is the giganticism of the, the whole plant. So when you compare the size of the fruit, uh, uh, and, uh, and this is also true for the size of the plant, so compare the size of the, the, the leaf, the, 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 so uh, the, these leaves uh, from these uh, cultivars or famous cultivars of, of tomato, and this one is, it's, it's a Brazilian one, <laughs> creating the uh, Instituto Agronomico de Campinas by Hiroshi Nagai, so it's quite nice cultivar. It is quite uh, a gigant plant when you compare to the Y type. And we know nothing about the genetic basis of this. So we decided in, in our group uh, to investigate this and uh, our approach, as uh, Roberta said, we use microton that is a, a tomato model uh, to study everything in our lab. So we start to cross uh, microton that this is quite <laughs> a tiny plant. <laughs> this is <it's> quite <laughs> interesting. And we start to cross it with a, li uh, uh, a white species and, and uh, we, we actually introgress uh, this small uh, uh, leaf. Uh, it, will, it will be better to, to see here uh, in this measurement because this, this although this, I, I love this, this photograph because uh, it's showing that in a, in a great number of plants, the, the phenotype is quite consistent. And this is the same photo, actually. This is just a line that we put here. 
So it's a very interesting phenotype. And uh, but the, what is more important and interesting in, in this kind of study is that we we also uh, discovered that uh, this this monogenic because it's quite difficult to to interrogate something that is polygenic, but uh, it it can of course, <laughs> and I will show you. Uh, depend on the this the selection that you 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 perform in it a back cross, uh, but uh, here well, what is important is that it also uh, has a a, a a great impact in the size of the fruit or or in the size of the 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 ovary that that is what you are uh, uh, seeing here I, I hope because uh, in my in my screen is not possible to see but okay. And uh, since uh, most of the genes that controls the size of the fruit in tomato were already mapped, and uh, we just combined two uh, papers, that is the one from Mathieu Klaus in Avignon to the one from Dan Shitwood in USA. And that this is interesting because Dan Shitwood was not very interested in, in, in tomato fruit, but uh, the tomato leaf and the variation behind this. So we just compared uh, the, the two uh, uh, public, uh, the, the two maps that were public, published, and uh, this is very interesting because here we have uh, something that is controlling both uh, the size of the fruit and the size of the leaf, and this is very important because this, this is the trait that we discover uh, in the in this line. We call this line toy. And uh, so we perform uh, genotype by sequence in, in the toy line. And uh, it, it confirms that the, the introgression, because this is a, it's an introgression. So we, what we expect is that uh, most of the, the, the genome, each one of the chromosome, uh, uh, it will be the same of, of microtome. This, this is nipped here, uh, may be significant or maybe not, but what is important is that we were able to, to as predicted, to see this introgression here in the end uh, of the chromosome seven as predicted uh, in these in this studies. So now we are trying to, to perform the fine map of, of toy. This is, will be important for, because we, 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 we think that it might be a, a gene of domesticate and this is quite uh, interesting for, or for the studies and, and to be used in the novel domestication. Okay, and now uh, I want to to go to the to the last uh, uh, part of my talk, that is why to perform the novel domestication. So I I can I, I can say that all that I have have done now it is was an introduction. Now it's the the talk is started. <laughs> Uh, why we, we have to perform, or why is important to perform the novel domestication? Okay, uh, probably Agustin have already uh, showed a, a similar uh, slide, but I, I love this. <laughs> we, uh, it's um, when you see the wide relative that are related to the tomato. What what we we see is that uh, tomato evolve in the in this in this line. Uh, near the uh, in the the Pacific coast of of South America, and in this environment you can have here, for example, high salinity in the seashore of the Galapagos Island, uh, uh, high altitude in the Andean region, and also uh, here uh, very uh, not only in the, in the in the Atacama but also in the in this coast a very dry uh, uh, environment. So it's not surprised that in, in the wide relative of tomato, we have salt resistant, cold resistant, drought resistant. And what is very interesting is that we have a lot of insect resistance. It, for those that are familiar with tomato, <laughs> insect resistance, well, it will be love to, to have some uh, salt resistant, cold resistant, drought resistant, but Insect is the, the real treat in tomato. Uh, the, if you have one, uh, uh, those that are from the tomato side of size, <laughs> side of size, we, we agree with me. Okay. Uh, and insect resistant in tomato is 
is it's quite interesting because it depends on a different component. And this is a par excellence, something that is polygenic because uh, it depends on uh, the plant development. So we, we know, we, we, we know, we know uh, uh, almost nothing about the genes that are important to make this kind of trichome. And insect resistance also depends on a lot of uh, specific biochemistry. So the, the, <clears throat> the chemicals that accumulate in the trichome, in this glandular trichomes, are very uh, uh, interesting ones. So this acyl sugar, it's a kind of a stick uh, uh, material that uh, it's quite effective to, to combat the, the 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 white fly uh, it's a, it's, a it, it, it's not only because it's a, it's a stick uh, but also uh, it it, uh, it can uh, poison the the white fly and not other insect the sesquiterpenes that are producing in type six trichome and this one are very interesting because it, it it's producing type uh, four trichome and I said that this is very very interesting because tomato uh, doesn't have uh, uh, have a uh, uh, type four trichome, so we start to to study this, and uh, we we took one of the species that are able to to produce this kind of uh, type four trichome. That so this species is one of the the one that is high resistant to white fly because it produces this sticky material that is acyl sugar. And we, we have done the same approach, approach with our, our fa favorite model that is microton. So we, we doing the, the integration, we, we came with a, a plant that were able to produce type four trichomes in tomato. As you can see here, we use uh, uh, the promoter of a gene that only express in the gland of, of type of four trichome. Uh, fuse it to the GFP, and uh, we, we got this nice picture here. Uh, the construction was from the Hobbit Loss. Uh, uh, it was published for the first time for the Hobbit Loss uh, group. This kind of construction is quite nice. And uh, when we performed the mapping of this introgression, we, we came with a different scenario. In this case, we it, we, we have done mapping by sequence, that meaning that we, we compare the, the genotype of, of a group of plants that are uh, microton-like and other that are GAT-like uh, in the segregation uh, uh, population. And uh, doing this, uh, we can say that in order to have that phenotype that is this kind of structure, the, the type 4 trichome in tomato, we need to have at least uh, a five uh, chromosomal region. So it's a quite complex trait. And uh, this, is, this is interesting because uh, as predicted, we only uh, introgressed the, the structure of the trichome. It doesn't mean that we, we, we introgress the, the, the chemicals that are behind this. And it seems that this is true because our line that is, we, we, we name it GET, Galapagos enhanced trichomes, uh, it's not resistant to white fly, uh, as you can see here. And this makes sense because, as I said, we didn't introgress the chemical, uh, 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 the chemicals that should be produced or, or the genes behind the, the metabolic pathways that, that are necessary to make acyl sugar. And when you compare, uh, compare uh, microton get with the they have, they are two parents, the, this near isogenic line that is, it's not near isogenic in this case, the microton and, and the donor, the Galapagensis. You see that Galapagensis has a huge amount, amount of uh, acyl sugars. <clears throat> and it's important that the, the difference is also qualitative because this kind of uh, acyl sugar here, this low, uh, the, this acyl with a long chain, a 12 carbon chain is enriched in, in Solano Galapagos and it might be a specific acyl sugar for res, to confirm resistance against uh, uh, insect. And to make things worse, when we see uh, the, the type four trichomes or get and we compare with the, the Galapagos, you can see that we have this droplet here and we don't have this. So we use a dye 
for acyl sugar. And uh, as you can see here, the acyl sugar, it's inside the trichome. And in the case of the GET, it, 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 uh, it can be exudate, so it's outside. And this is obvious, obviously important for insect resistance because it's a kind of a stick. And so we, we, we create this model that is, if you want to transfer uh, acyl sugar-based insect resistance to tomato, you should to perform at least these three steps. And uh, as we have shown, because we accomplished this, this first step here, uh, there are, there are not all, uh, it, this is not monogenic. There are more, the, the, there are different chromosomal region controlling this. And who knows then the, how many uh, genes we, 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 we should to integrate or pyramide to have uh, a good production of acyl sugar. And this acyl sugar should be for another, uh, so we will need another genes to, to allow it to be exudated. So the conclusion of this, and, the, and this is a good conclusion for this third part is that, that uh, as I said, is why to perform the no domestication is that in this case, it will be better uh, for, in our opinion, to domesticate, to instead uh, of doing this, to try to pass this to tomato, maybe we, we should consider to domesticate the, the Galapagans uh, doing the same approach that uh, Agustin had have, have shown you, had shown you uh, yesterday, that is try to recreate in the white species, that is the Solano Galapagans here, he create the same mutation that occurred during uh, tomato domestication. And, uh, this is quite interesting because Galapagans is not only insect resist, it, it's also salt resistant. As I said, uh, most of the Galapagos tomatoes evolve in the seashore in the high salinity environment. And uh, I don't know if this is related to the salt resist, but this is the, the tomato with the highest uh, bricks. And bricks is the content of, uh, of the solids of the fruit. This is it's quite important for uh, processing tomato. And this is quite important for the taste of the tomato. This is, I can say to you that uh, the taste of this tomato is quite good because most of the bricks are sugar and acid. But uh, of course, the, the fruit is, is very small. Okay, uh, I think that I, I have done this in a very fast way. <laughs> I was concerned about the time. <laughs> But this is the, the, the former and the current student that uh, in my lab, uh, 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 most of, some of them are, are in the, in the novel domestication uh, top and uh, other are, uh, are specialists on trichom. It's, it's quite nice when you, when you talk about trichom, but uh, they start to count in trichom and to observe trichom this is quite difficult. And Eloise, it's one of the, the one that is, is doing this in a better way in, in the lab. And uh, these people, of course, uh, uh, are my collaborators. Uh, so uh, for this, this, this work, we, we have this collaboration with, uh, uh, in Germany, in the USA, uh, as I have, uh, uh, and uh, here in USA to uh, Wagner Benedict, that is in this project uh, uh, with the, uh, related to the domestication of Galapagense. Agustin, there was a, a speaker uh, uh, yesterday. So we, he used to say my, my postdoc uh, some years ago, and uh, now he, he is a PI in, in his lab in, in, in Vissosa. Uh, this guy is from my university. It's now USA do, doing a sabbatical leave. The Severino is the guy that helped me with the, the chemical chemicals behind tomato and also Alan Thyssen and uh, his postdoc Nick Bergal. And uh, these are the, 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 the agencies that fund our work. And uh, okay, I'll, uh, I will put this, this but th this is, is postponed. I, I actually don't know when this will occur, but we, we, we have this new phytology uh, uh, trust uh, symposium. It's a kind of competition. We, we, we got the money from them, but now with the COVID, this was postponed. But uh, we, we intend to do 
a symposium about uh, tomato domestication and, uh, and uh, not tomato domestication, but uh, domestication from different kind of, of plant. So uh, that, that's all folks. Uh, thank you for, for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Lazaro. Uh, now we have a minute for, uh, some minutes for questions. Uh, the first question is if there is only so much the shoots can do with the resources it's given. Is there a role for root development in plant domestication as well? This is quite a nice question. <clears throat> uh, I, well, uh, in uh, uh, I, 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 I should say here that uh, most of my example are, are in tomato, will be in tomato because it's, it's my plant model and I, I'm a plant physiologist. So I, I'm very stick to a, a model. Uh, breeders, they, they tend to be more eclectic. Uh, I, I know that there are lots of uh, example in in grass, uh, in 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 uh, we, uh, I think that uh, in rice, uh, many traits that are related to domestication that is related to the root. But in the case of tomato, no. But uh, there are very interesting things. In the case of the fruit way choo choo, uh, the 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 organ where we you have the uh, uh, the the bigger <laughs> the bigger expression of the gene is on root, but uh, we 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 don't know what is the 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 role of uh, fruit weight chew uh, chew uh, chew chew in, in on root. So I have a student a PhD student that are creating isogenic lines to to see the impact of this domestication gene. Uh, on the root because we, we know the expression, but we, we don't know the phenotype. In order to know the phenotype, we have to create this, this isogenic lines. And we hope that we get some nice phenotype and a good paper on this. But I, I don't have an example of domestication, of gene related to domestication in tomato. I'm sorry for this. If someone knows one in, in, in another model, it would be good to know. But it's a good question. Okay, the, the second one, uh, is the novel domestication depending on CRISPR-Cas9 technology or is it possible to make it using other technologies Technologies, or perhaps by introgression? Yeah, this is another nice question, but my, I'm quite suspicious to say this because when we, where I put here that most of the, the the domesticated alleles that uh, the genes be, uh, or the alleles that uh, was created during domesticate are unique alleles, very difficult to to be uh, recreated using uh, gene editing. Uh, a good approach will be uh, to perform integration, but I I I also must to say that uh, there are some limitations behind integration. Introgression is a very time-consuming technique. In the case of microtone, it's quite not, it's quite easy to, to perform introgression because it's a very fast cycle plant. It's a model plant, but it's it's quite difficult to to perform introgression in 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 plants that has a just one one cycle per year or or, or even more than this. And uh, another thing, another uh, concern uh, behind uh, introgression is uh, uh, genetic li linkage. So uh, we, we have done a lot of integration uh, in, uh, in tomato before. Uh, tomato is one of the fewer species where during improvement, the, um, the genetic diversity actually, at least in, 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 in terms of, uh, of SNPs, that is the, the kind of analysis that was performed, the, the, the diversity increases. It's not, it's not a bottleneck. It's not a because uh, we have performed a lot of integration, but uh, there are a lot of uh, linkage drive. Now it's easy to to clean this 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 linkage, because as I said to you, uh, before, in tomato we have a lot of uh, the, the when you compare the genome of tomato with the genome of the the white species, the synteny synteny is quite large. It's and uh, the homologies is also so it's it's easy to make recombina recombination. And now that with this technology, all of this technology of uh, 
whole genome uh, sequencing, we, we can uh, curate this kind of uh, linkage drag. So we can clean the, the chromosomal, chromosomal region that we don't, we don't need. But it will be time consuming and uh, in some cases will be fast and easier to, to perform uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas uh, uh, or other uh, gen editing uh, techniques. Okay, we have another one uh, from Fernanda. What would what would the advantage to be domesticated the wild tomato tomato be over, for example, gene, edit, gene editing? Wouldn't there be too many genes that would have to be changed in the wild tomato wild tomato? Yeah, uh, as I, I, I put on. Uh, um, I'm not, uh, I think that I understood the question. Uh, well, the, the advantage to, to, to create, to, 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 to do, to perform uh, the novel domestication in tomato is that now all tomato that we, you eat are based on uh, Solano Lycopescum, that is the descendant of uh, Solano Pimpinelli form. This was some, something that was, have been done, um, uh, thousand of years ago and uh, now we can start this again and probably show something better uh, at least for the condition that we we have now we can sell the the idea of the novel domestication putting for example cl climate change so a, a good way to to sell this idea is that well the plants that we have domesticated in the past are probably not the ones that will face better the climate, the, the new uh, climate that are coming. And in the case of tomatoes, it's quite obvious. We, we don't have uh, drought resistant, salt resistant, or insect resistant in tomato, and this will be quite difficult to create in tomato. But if we go uh, and start to do this again, uh, starting from a species that are insect resistant or drought resistant, salt resistant, this will be good. A bit uh, big, but uh, it's just, uh, it's not only domestication. Where what is difficult is not to domesticate. What is difficult is to improve. So the uh, the, the tomato that we we eat nowadays have hundreds of years in of improvement. So it, you cannot expect that doing the no domestication you you can create something like the the tomato that we have today. It's it's, it's it's like to start with um, uh, an opera operation, uh, operation system in, in compu computer, like the, 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 uh, the Linux or Linux and, 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 and get something like the Windows. But there are some advantages to, to start with the, the, the Linux because there are errors that, was, that uh, have been committed when they, they made the Windows that we can skip from doing this and actually Windows is a kind of, of, of improvement like uh, uh, similar to the one that we have in tomato breeding. There are some uh, errors committed in the past that we cannot uh, set. So it, the best thing to do is to start again, if you know what I mean. But uh, so there are advantages, but uh, it, uh, it depends on uh, each case. Okay. Uh, we have another one. Dr. Lazaro, do you think it's possible to transfer the high bricks for commercial tomato with over 160 grams fruit size? Yeah, this is a, <laughs> this guy knows about uh, 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 tomato because uh, that. This is the, the thing that I, I love to say that because I'm a plant, actually a plant physiologist that, that, that uh, nowadays uh, uh, it's impossible to, to study plant physiology, especially if you are from the plant development side, if you don't, don't like genetics. But I, I'm actually, I'm not a geneticist, I'm a plant physiologist. And, uh, <clears throat> and in plant physiology, we, we, we learned that uh, there are many uh, traits or many uh, uh, things that are, uh, how to say this, they, you cannot uh, have the two at the same time. This is quite classical. So uh, bricks and yield are, are quite uh, 
uh, sometimes they behave like something that uh, in, that's not pro, uh, proportional. If you if you have a, a high yield, you have a low bricks and vice versa. So it, this will not be possible. Uh, but uh, for example, we what we have in Solano Galapagans is a bricks that is uh, 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 in terms of bricks, uh, it's 15 or, or this is quite huge bricks. And uh, in tomato, we have uh, the, the bricks is five. So it's a, it's, a, it's a huge difference. But probably we will not have even, a, uh, even though we, we just create a, a cherry tomato, uh, not a beef steak tomato, but a cherry tomato from uh, Solano Galapagans, so we'll probably we'll get a bricks of 10, but a bricks of 10 will be also good but not the 15, the original 15, because if you improve the size of the fruit, we will offer, obviously you will not have the, the same uh, the value of brief. This is a very good question. So, and anybody has another question? I think we finish here. So, Dr. Lazaro, on behalf of Shivank and everyone who is watching the symposium, I would like to thank you once more for participating in our event and also for your clarification about the doubts that have surged. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> okay. um, we have just uh, put the link in the chat. So for everybody who wants the certificate, the certificate of presence in the event. Uh, just remember to put your whole name and your right email, and the form will be available until 7 p.m. of today. Okay, thank you, Roberta. Now we open the final session of the fourth International Meeting on Plant Breeding. It's my honor to introduce the winner of the Roland Benkowski Award. This award is a tribute to Professor Roland Benkowski, who contributed to the fields of quantitative and population genetics, plant breeding, and conservation of genetic resources in Brazil. Among the 20 outstanding abstracts we received this year, we had the challenge of choosing a number to be evaluated by one of our guest speakers and six guest collaborators from partner companies. Thank you, Walter Bernardi, Mario Sergio Sigrist, Julia Morosini, Claudia Godoy, Sabrina Chabrigas, Adriano Mastro Domenico, and Sandra Milak for, support, for supporting us on that. The criteria considered on this evaluation were innovation, scientific and social impact and applicability. Three selected abstracts were presented in our event and have been evaluated by a specialized judge committee. We appreciate all the effort of those who participated in the abstract selection process. So the three candidates to receive an honorable mention are Alexandre Ilja Ono, author of the abstract entitled Assessing the Potential of Deep Learning for Sugar Cane Yellow Leaf Symptom Severity Phenotyping. Yara Gonçalves dos Santos, author of the abstract Major Locus for Spontaneous Haploid Genome Doubling in Exotic Maize Germplasm Detected by a Case Control GWAS. And Marcos Antonio de Godoy Filho, author of the abstract entitled The Novo Assembly of Contrasting Soybean Genomes for the Study of Resistance to the Stink Bug Complex. These three candidates will receive a free registration for the fifth IMTB edition in 2021. We already have our secret virtual envelope here and I will announce the winner. So, Jivank has the honor to give the Roland Benkovsk Award to Marcos Antonio de Godoy Filho. Congratulations, Marcos. Do you want to share some words with the audience? 
you can open your microphone and video if you want. Hi, thank you. I am so proud to receive this award. Uh, I would like to thank you, my advisor and João Viana and our collaborators of this work. Thank you. Thank you so much for your participation and we wish you all the best for the progress of the research works received in this edition. We'll contact you privately to send a prize with your name on it to your address. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And before we close our second and last day, I would like to say thank you for joining us on the fourth International Meeting on Plant Breeding hosted by GVENC and Corteva AgriSciences. It has been a unique year in a whole different context, but still very useful to reinvent ourselves for new opportunities to learn, discuss, and think about solutions to new issues. We would also like to invite you in advance to our fifth IMPB, which will hopefully be held presentially in 2021 in Piracicaba. And just a last reminder that the certificate emission will be available for the participants who completed the form sent on the Zoom webinar chat. We wish you all a very good evening. Bye, thank you.